What's up, everybody? This is Kevin Special K Daily, formerly of the Harlem Globetrotters. And you're listening to and watching the Burn Down Podcast. Well, so far tonight, we've sure heard a lot from Special K Daily. Let's learn more about one of the Globetrotters' newest stars. I grew up in Panama City, Panama. This is the place for me. It is just something that I was supposed to do. This is what I've been chasing this whole time. Special K, baby. What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of The Burn Down. Today's guest is a former basketball player, captain of the Harlem Globetrotters for 10 years, and author, philanthropist, public speaker, and even Michael Jordan's stunt double in a Gatorade commercial. That man is Kevin Daly. What's going on, brother? Man, it's my pleasure. Anytime I get a chance to talk about cigars with some great people, I'm there. Love, man. Like I said, we got a. Uh, it's gonna be a good show. Um, you're the second, actually, basketball player that we've had on the podcast. People that are that are fans of the podcast that go back, you know, John Stark's episode that we have. So now we got Kevin on here, Harlem Globetrotter. Another yes, basketball player. And we're going to yeah. talk basketball. We're going to talk cigars. We're going to talk about about you. This whole episode is about you, man. Getting to know Kev. Yeah, I will never get tired about talking about me, man. <laughs> we do this all night, man. <laughs> I love it. I love it. So before we get into the episode, we obviously are a cigar podcast. We got to light up a cigar. So what are you smoking today? Well, today I'm going to smoke the... Oliva Siri V. Perfect. It's one of our favorites. That's what I'm going with. You can never go wrong with that cigar. One, um, one of my favorites is the Milanio. Have you ever had the Milanio before? Absolutely. That was the number one. I did a video on the top five, and that was number one of uh, according to Cigar Aficionado. <laughs> yes. Yeah. What 24, was that? 2014. 2014. Yeah, the Figurado. That's honestly how I found that cigar. When I, fir- I started first getting into cigars around 2017. And uh, I heard about that, so I purchased that cigar based solely on that, and I've been hooked ever since. And you know what's interesting, too, is a lot of times with the number one cigar of the year, I find that when it becomes number one and it gets dubbed that name, the quality over the next couple of years goes down because everybody's going out and buying it, and they can't keep up with the production. But that one yeah. didn't. That one, I feel like, it stayed yeah, pretty, consistent. pretty good. It is. It is. What so, are you guys smoking? So I'm smoking the Aroma de Cuba Mi Amor. Yes, yes, yes. I'm familiar with that. Now this is a, a first for me. This is the illusion, the uh, illusion. I hate freaking say this. Um, the illusione, illusione. This is Fume de Mora, the de, de Amora. Oh, that's um, uh, Smoke of Love. Is it okay? Yeah. So Hecho in Nicaragua. So made in Nicaragua. And uh, Fumo de Amore. Was that a Toro about? Yeah, it's like a 6x52, it feels like. But it's a big cigar. So before when we light up, who is Kevin Daly? Who is he? What's he all about? What's his story? Let the people know. Well, you know, if you... It depends on um, different time frames, right? Kevin Daly today is a, a family man, uh, a husband that number one priority is just making sure that my family is taken care of uh, a good friend to, to friends. That's truly me, man. I will say a family man with the priorities of taking care of his family and, and friends. You sound like a true gentleman. Yeah. Spoken like a true gentleman. That's at the end of the day, that's what it's all about, right? Like there's all these other things that are going at the end of the day, number one priority is family now? We a- now if we asked you that twenty years ago, who would Kevin Daly be twenty years ago? Man, twenty years ago, nothing mattered to me but basketball. Everything, the, I, everything was secondary to basketball. If there was anything that could get in between my basketball and I, they would be eliminated out of my life, including family. <laughs> you know, it was it was number one. So that's why I say it depends on when you ask, right? Today, completely different priorities. Different things are more important to me today than they were at that time. I didn't have kids 20, day, 20 years ago either. 
right? So yeah, right. My old, I have two. My oldest is 16, so she wasn't even thought of at yeah. that time. But it's 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 wild how things change like that, right? But when you when if you speak to a lot of the you know the greats or anybody that that excelled in certain fields, like professional basketball player, Harlem Globetrotter, traveled the world. You have to make sacrifices if you want to be at that level. Like you kind of have to make a decision. And at that time, you said twenty years ago, before you had a family, the decision was, "I'm going to play basketball." So everything else took a back seat to basketball. So th- that decision was made by me when I was five. You know, five. but at, twenty years ago, yes, when I was five. But twenty years ago, yes, that was still the plan, right? And. Like I said, everything had to take a back seat to that. But one thing is that people don't realize when you're an athlete, when you're an entertainer, holidays are around. You know, when we're watching a football game on a, on a, on Thanksgiving, one team is away from home and away from their family. The other team is home, right? So Part of the sacrifice is being away from your family. When I was uh, with the Globetrotters for 10 years, I spent maybe eight to nine months in the U.S. The other time was out somewhere in uh, either in another state or another country. So I missed a lot of birthdays. I missed a lot of uh, New Year's. You know, I didn't get to spend New Year's Eve with my oldest daughter until she was 10 years old when I retired. Wow. So, you know, so those were the, some tough sacrifices. Um, I wouldn't change it for anything. Part of the reason why I retired was because I, I wanted to be more in her life. And it was it was just that time. And me having those sacrifices have have granted her a good life, too. Right. She's in a good in a good place. Uh, you know, going to she's going to go to college soon. And, you know, so some some positives come out of it but definitely you're gonna have to sacrifice something at some point yeah absolutely i mean just the other on christmas day when they have all of the uh nba games yeah like you had mentioned there's what five nba games four or five nba games and even so you're playing on christmas day and even if you're at home now it's not like you can wake up and enjoy Christmas. You're up at six o'clock in the morning and you're going to the arena. You're getting your shots up. Yeah. You're going through tape. So you're busy all day long. Mm-hmm. So you have right. to put the, the Christmas celebration on the back seat. Yeah, it's, it, it's more about the bigger picture. Like you said, like down the road, what is this sacrifice worth it? If I miss this year, is it going to be is it going to be better for the future years to come? Which obviously it was. So right. so speaking how you said you had this this dream and this image when you were five years old, how did you grow up? And so who were some of your inspirations growing up to have this vivid, you know, goal of yours at five years old? Sure, man. So I'm, I'm originally from Central America. I'm from Panama originally, still fluent in Spanish. That was my first language. Every now and then you can hear an accent come out. It's not a, it is not a Dallas accent. <laughs> it's, a, it's a Latin accent, right? <laughs> So in Panama, it was, it was kind of an odd situation. I grew up in a middle-class neighborhood, but my mom passed away when I was three. And so half of these, the income for the house, for the household was completely removed, right? But my dad wanted to stay in that neighborhood because that's what he envisioned for us. So we struggled to stay there in a middle-class neighborhood with nothing. Wow. Which to me is tougher when you live amongst others that don't have anything because it's highlighted. You know, there were Christmas times when um, the kids would all have their Christmas gifts and I had nothing, you know. So don't, it's, it's a little bit tougher that way. Right. But I I grew up playing every single sport for fun. And something about basketball is what I fell in love with. And I think it was the fact that no matter what, I could play basketball. If somebody wanted to come play with me or not, I could still go play. You know, you can't play football by yourself. You can't, you can, it's tough to play baseball by yourself, you know, soccer by yourself, right? But basketball, you know, if if people wanted to go and we could play five on five, we can play one on one, three on three, or I can, I don't need y'all. I can go play myself. So that was kind of like uh, when I, an outlet of mine when I lost my mother is uh, and once I started gaining 
uh, knowledge of what truly happened. Cause I was three, so I didn't really know, but then I started growing up and I realized like, wait, what happened here? And that was kind of my outlet was basketball. So then I was thinking at an early age, I said, I know people get jobs and all that. So I was saying, hey, you know what? It will be cool if somebody pays me to do something that I'll probably do for free anyway. Right? So that's when that thought came into my mind. Like, yo. And I started watching NBA games and uh, learning that these guys are getting paid for this. So I made a goal, man. I said, you know what? My goal is to get paid to play basketball. And I will and, and I want to play against the best and, and amongst the best. And I also want to travel the world. Now, again, I'm in Panama, small country, smaller than the state of South Carolina, to put it into perspective. So people are like, man, get out of here. How the heck, you know, how is that gonna happen? And I didn't know how that was gonna happen. But one thing that I learned early. And the early ages, don't worry about how. All I did was worry about getting myself ready for when it was going to happen. I didn't. I never thought that it wasn't going to happen. It was just a matter of being ready when I had the opportunity, and then making sure that I take advantage of it. So, eventually, when I was 13 years old, my dad decided to move to the U.S. So I'm like, oh damn, okay, we're getting a little bit closer. So we moved to uh, to L.A. And in LA, I started playing college. Uh, well, let's start, I started playing high school and I started getting better and better. Eventually I earned some uh, college scholarships. And um, after college in the year 2000 is when I finished college, I was playing in different summer leagues with NBA players, you know, Baron Davis, he was a roommate of mine at, at UCLA. So right after college, we were playing in different summer pro leagues, Paul Pierce, He's the same era as me in L.A., so I was on his team every summer league. So this particular summer, um, I was having a great summer, fantastic summer, because my thought was all these people are coming to see Baron, Paul Pierce, and all these other big names, which I'm okay with, But and some of them may not know my name, but before they leave, they're going to know who I am. No doubt. Right. So I was treating these summer league games while these NBA players are just having fun. I'm treating it like I'm in game seven of the championship in the NBA because I'm trying to get paid. Right. So uh, eventually I got interest from several teams and I played in different countries. And then uh, one of the summers I got interest from the Harlem Globetrotters. <clears throat> and at the time it was the most stable for me and just the glamour of saying, man, I played for the Harlem Globetrotters. So I went ahead and, and I took that opportunity. And then 10 years later, man, I, I, I ended up being, uh, you know, leaving my, my mark on the team and the history of the team, you know? Special K, right? Special K was the nickname? Yes, sir. That's awesome. See, that's, I mean, that's an incredible story because I, what I picked up from that main point is that you didn't know how it was going to happen. You just knew that was going to happen. And that's a- when we make goals, it's none of our business to, to worry about how it's going to happen. You just got to make sure that you do all the things to prepare yourself for when it happens. Exactly. I believe in the law of attraction, man. And, it, and it's about keeping a positive mind and, and um, just going for it. So I never had a negative thought. And, and let me tell you this. Right before I signed, so when I was going overseas and playing in different countries, I was getting paid, but I was never getting paid that much money where I could just come home and relax, right? So this particular summer, before I decided to go with the Globetrotters, I was dead broke, literally eating peanut butter and jelly for breakfast, lunch, and dinner every single day. But I was still going to these, to the workouts. I was still going to these games. Nobody knew my situation, but I don't know how. The mayor of a city called West Covina, he learned about my situation, not through me, maybe through my agent. And he gave me two weeks stay at a Holiday Inn. He said, man, I want to help you out. This is all I can do for you. Because I was about to live out of my car. This is all I can do for you is get you this two weeks. And I said, man, thank you. I appreciated it. And two days before I was supposed to move out of that hotel is when I got the offer when, again, I had no money and I got an offer for a hundred thousand um, dollars 
but for from the uh, Harlem Globetrotters, which was my my starting pay when I first started. <clears throat> I ended up with way more than that, but that's how I started. But thinking about going from zero to six digits, right? And then they asked me, they say, hey, I don't know if you're going to be able to do this, but we need you to move to Phoenix right away because they were based out of Phoenix at the time. <laughs> and to me, that was like, Shit, I'll move right now. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah like, I, I'm on my way. I'm on the next plane out of here. So I dropped everything and I moved to Phoenix, man. So two days before I was supposed was about to be in the streets. Wow. I mean, I love that. Like yeah. you said, law of attraction. You didn't know, you just just knew for a fact that we talk about this all the time in the podcast. We're big um advocates and believers of law of attraction, positive mindset, just putting in the work, consistency every single day, and getting ready for when. Uh, when the time comes. And there's a book uh, called Start With Why by Simon Sinek, which talks about, it's like a, uh, they talk about a, a circle, like a golden circle. And they say, on the outside is the how. Like, don't start on the outside and work your way in. Start on the inside, which is the why. Why are you doing what you're doing? They said, if you focus on the why, then the how will take care of itself. Yeah. If you focus on the how. If you focus on the why, whenever you come when you're demotivated, the why is going to keep you motivated. Exactly. Exactly. And that's, I, 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 that image like stuck with me. It's like, don't focus on all that other stuff. Focus on why you're doing this and what you can control right now. Yeah. Absolutely. And what you can control is putting in the work every day, showing up. Like you said, you were probably exhausted and drained from just eating peanut butter and jelly, but it didn't matter. Show up. Put the work in. Your time will come. You will be rewarded. You reap what yeah, you sow, right? No doubt. Because, yep. I mean, it, it's easily – you could have kind of just fell off and be like, you know what? I'm going to take a week off. I'm going to kind of just chill, let my body relax. And maybe that opportunity would have came that week. And then maybe if you didn't go to that practice or go to that workout or whatever, you might not have been ready. But that's, an, that's how we both view life. Like we do little minute things every single day that are kind of tedious but – it builds up to what we're overall trying to try, what we're trying to get at. And yep. it's it speaks volumes on, you know, you're a perfect example of that, which is awesome because we preach that all the time. Let me know when the, I got lights right here. Let me know if it gets too dark. Eventually it will be. Okay. Yeah, no doubt. So, so going through the process of living out of a hotel, almost living out of your car, eating PB&J, I mean... PB and J. That's still a pretty solid. I, mean, I, listen, I, I that's how I, I still went through college, PB&J. man. I got through college on PB and J. When I first, I moved to Atlanta to for a job and I had no money and everyone was like, Eric, what are you eating? I'm like, peanut butter and jelly. Eric, what are you eating? Peanut butter and jelly. I mean, it's a classic. Oh, yeah, it might be like two or three peanut butter and jellies, but right, right. <laughs> hey. got to build up the calories right. somehow. So, for, it's like a two part. So, where did you learn that mentality of kind of just having that that mindset of you know what? Everything negative, I'm just going to block it out. I'm just going to focus on what I need to do. And and what were some of the things that you learned that maybe you you made a mistake and you're like, you know what? I made a mistake and I'm going to learn from that. You know, I don't know where I learned it and I didn't have a name for it until my cousin suggested a book for me, um, the, the, the Secret. Yes. Right? Which talks about the law of attraction. That's the first time where I, where I actually put name to what I was already doing. So when I read that book, I said, damn, that's what I've been doing. I just didn't know. I just didn't know that I was doing it. Yeah. I, so I don't know where, to be honest, man, I, I, I have no idea. I've, I've tried to, to, to think back and see, you know, where did I gain that from? But no clue. Um, but I'm glad that uh, I'm glad that I was probably born that way, I guess. Yeah, but not yeah. everyone has that. Not everyone is born with that. Not everyone thinks like that. It's a very, very small group of people that have that mindset. Yeah, yeah. So the second part of your question was mistakes that I made. Um, I mean, it depends on what do you mean, right? I've, I've made many. I've made many mistakes. You know, when I was married at first, made some mistakes. Uh, I made some mistakes. You know, in college and high school, but. But one thing that I can say is that I have learned from mistakes that I've made. And I was just having this conversation last week. My goal is to every day just do positive things because I know in return, I believe in karma too, right? In return, positive things will happen to me. 
right? And then somebody asks me, hey, what, what, what do you mean? What, what are positive things? What are good things, right? And I say, I think we all define that in a different manner, right? What's positive and what, what's good to you may not be good to me, right? But I think it's clear, one thing that is uh, unanimous is that if you do good by others, right? We all know what we shouldn't do to others. So uh, I just try to live my life that way, um, be positive. And when somebody calls me, I don't want them to leave that conversation down. I want them to know when they calling me, it's gonna be an upbeat conversation don't come up, don't come over here crying about certain things because I'm gonna ask you, okay, what are you gonna do about it? How are you gonna fix it? Right? I'm not gonna cry with you. We're, I'm gonna work on a solution to fix it, right? So I just try to be a positive force, man. I love it. I, I love that because there's a there's a a PowerPoint and it's on YouTube, and I forgot where it's from. I think it was um not a uh not a monk, not a, a Buddhist or I forgot what the, what the term is, but there was a PowerPoint the guy was showing and it was uh, like a flow chart and it said, um, do you have a problem? Yeah. Right? And it says like, yes, you have a problem. Can you do something about it? Yes. And then it flows into, then why worry? Don't worry, do something, right? And then it says, do you have a problem? Yes. Can you do something about it? No. Then why worry? And it says, yeah. do you have a problem? No. Then why worry? So it's like everything fo folds down into... Why are you worrying? So like, to your point, when you come with me with a problem and all you want to do is talk about the problem and complain about it, don't come to me with that crap. If you have a problem and you have and you want to talk about a solution, absolutely. But stop complaining about it and do something about it. And if you can't do anything about it, then don't complain because it's out of your control. There's nothing you can do. You're going you're gonna to learn. You're going to learn today one way or another. You're going to learn today. Yeah. No doubt. All right. So let's 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 get into some of the some of the fun stuff now. Harlem Harlem Globetrotting. I always wanted to see the Harlem Globetrotters. I was never ever able to see them, but I was telling you earlier for my birthday once. Hey, hey. Hold on. So you never when they in New York, let me know, man. I'll get you some tickets, both of y'all. For real? Oh man, you too. Hey, just let me know, man. I'll make a call. I'm not on the team anymore, but but uh I, I can get you some tickets, man. Oh, that would I be fantastic. Because I've only I haven't seen them either. I've only seen them uh on TV when I play the uh Washington Generals. My <laughs> wife, my wife was just telling me she's always she goes, Oh, I've seen the Harlem Globe like we uh live up in Westchester. And uh she was like, Yeah, when I was like in eighth oh. grade, we saw the Harlem Globetrotters play at, you know, some place in Westchester. And I was like, Well, what were the years? And she, I think she did like 06 or something like that. Well, I was like, well, you definitely saw the guy who we're having tomorrow on the podcast, yeah. Kevin Daly. I think it was somewhere in East Chester, New York or something like that. But um, I was like I was saying before, though, I had the biggest Harlem Globetrotter jersey. Like I still have pictures of it. If I find it, I'll send it to you. But it was like a dress. I was like the times where like baggy, baggy clothes were the thing. And I was walking around like eighth grade with this baggy. Yeah, that's the late nineties, uh, baggy clothes. Two thousands, yeah. and it was my favorite thing ever. <laughs> we're gonna have to get some. Uh, we're gonna have to get another one of those. Maybe the if we're going to a whole hot and glow try again, they gotta get a jersey. Oh, I'm course. not showing up without a jersey. <laughs> I've seen I've seen Kevin's jerseys on eBay for sale. Sign Kevin's jerseys for sale. I might have to buy one. All right, I'm gonna rock both of them. Yeah, right? People will be like, "Who is that?" Be like, man, you don't know. You ain't a glow try to fan if you don't know who this is. <laughs> Come on, <laughs> Come on, son. So what so what were some of your favorite things about playing with the Harlem Globetrotters? But man, you know what? Uh, the my favorite things are not even basketball related. When I joined the Globetrotters, you know, I just thought it was another team that I was joining, but I never realized how much of an impact we could have on people's lives. And I'll give you examples. You know, every after every game, we would stay and sign autographs. I remember the, vividly this lady asked me to sign her jeans and I signed her jeans and I interacted with her like I normally would be interacting with anybody else she went home that day and wrote me an email and said hey I appreciate so much the way that you treated me I've battled cancer three times and if I die tomorrow the way you made me feel I would die happy wow wow you know um I had so I lost my mother to suicide and when I was uh, I was signing autographs again, a mom came up to me. She said, you know, you see my son right there. He's 15. He tried to commit suicide. And she didn't even know the background of, of so I said, hey, ma'am, I don't know if I can help. I'm not an expert, but 
send me an email and I'll talk to him. At least I'll talk to him. So he was like in a, in a bad place, like in the hospital on watch, suicide watch. I mean, seriously, right? So uh, I talked to him. Eventually, I invited the family to come to Dallas, and we we spent a weekend together. They, we went to Six Flags one day. The next day, took him to the gym, and we just played some one-on-one. And then I just stayed in contact with him, and I just started to see the change in him. And the mom would tell me, oh, my God, he won't believe it. And now he's getting good grades and all this. And it was just by having a conversation with a guy that I had his ear, you know? So those are, those are the type of stories when you say what are my favorite things. The basketball is great. You know, the countries that I've traveled to, it's, it's been fantastic. You know, playing in front of 15,000 and all this, and Madison Square Garden and all that. But the impact that I was able to make on certain people, that's the favorite thing of them all. That's amazing. And like you said, it's just – it's just having the conversation. Like a lot of times people just, they just want to be heard. They just want to be talked to. They want to be listened to. So just having the conversation with somebody can change their entire yeah. day. We talk about all the time. We're going back to what you were saying with doing good things every single day. What some people, what, you know, consider good things. Like the smallest little thing could change somebody's day. You could see somebody, you pass them in the mall or pass them on the street. You're like, hey, man, that's a nice jacket. I like that. And they say, yeah. oh, thank you very much. That tiny little comment. Yeah. Could make their whole. They, you have no idea what they're going through. They could have such a crappy day, and you just saying that little comment could change their whole day. Most definitely, absolutely, I agree. Yeah, I always, you know, personally, I always am a person that always is positive, energetic, no matter what I'm doing. Obviously, I have my off days, but majority, I'm known as a very upbeat, happy guy. And like yourself, when people I, when people talk to me, I want to make sure they have a good conversation. We lead yeah. off, we end on a conversation on a good note. And because I, I like just like yourself, I like lifting people up. I like having good conversations and making people feel like they're known. Like I always come, hey, nice pair of socks. You know, you got a nice, yeah, you got a right, fresh right. cut. You got a fresh cut. Some whatever. Just notice something. Say something nice about everybody that you see. And uh, it, it, it goes a long way as to Justin's point. But there's not a lot of people that do that. And there needs to be more Kevin Daly's and Eric Josephson's and Justin Heisig's in the world because <laughs> the world would be a way better place. I mean, it, it falls onto the, the the golden rule: do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Right? No doubt, no doubt. Now, were were a lot of the other Harlem Globetrotters like yourself? Were they very interactive, engaging with other people, or were you kind of just taking it one step further? Well, yeah, I think it's, it it comes with the role, right? Being able to engage with the crowd and with the, especially with the kids. Now we all had different roles within the team, right? I was what what you call the showman which is kind of like the leader on the court. Um, want, so I, I will wear a microphone and I'm in charge of most of the jokes throughout the entire game. So you'll be hearing my voice throughout the entire game. So that was just part of my role, but it, it was just part of my personality too. Now, some of the other guys, their role is a little bit slightly different, but as the globe trotter, you will have to find a way to learn how to interact with the crowd. Right. Uh, some some of the guys are, you know, we're regular people. So some guys are introverted. So we had to pull it out of them. Right. Some of them just pulled it out during the time that the lights were on. And once the lights were off, you know, don't don't bother. Me. Yeah. You know, but that was just part of my personality. Uh, one thing I, I didn't whenever we were in town and I'm like walking through the mall or whatever, I didn't like people to know who I was. Um, because I, I see myself as just a regular person, even when I was playing, it's just that I had a different job than other people, a unique job, but we're still the same. So I didn't like the treatment of, Oh my God, this is, I didn't like that. So I will not wear anything to say Holland Glow Trotters. I'll just be like in a plain shirt or whatever, and try to try to blend in that it didn't always work. Um, but that was my goal at least. Yeah, because that's it's a good point that you bring up because that it's everybody's the same. Just you had a different job than most people do. You had a very unique yeah. job. You're an entertainer, and I feel like that's a that's a lot of people in those positions, the pro athletes or or famous musicians, whatever. 
they're just regular people. I have a buddy, my my brother from another mother works in Manhattan. He runs a restaurant there and he gets famous people all the time. Anytime the Knicks are playing or anybody's at the garden, they're all coming into his restaurant to eat. And he says all they want to, they just want to have a regular dinner like everybody right. else does. They don't want to be bothered. They just happen to have, you know, a specific job that they make millions of dollars a year. But right. they're regular. They have the same problems that everybody else has. Yeah. They have the same, you know, family issues. They have all these other things that are going on. They just want to sit down and have have dinner. Right. True. Now, did you have like a special? Uh, like, I know we've asked like John Starks and Ed Reed and all these guys. Like, did they have? Did you have like a special routine before your before all your games or like some some kind of ritual that you performed for like good luck or something like that? Do you have any type of things like that? So uh, it wouldn't be for good luck, but it would just be to get myself mentally ready and physically ready, right? So I would just go through a little workout routine uh, in the locker room. Uh, we were a little different. So you, like in regular games, you see the guys warming up a little bit and all that. You wouldn't see that in the Globetrotter game because we do that all that before the doors are open. And like next time you see, whenever you do see us, the show is on, right? So I'll be in the back doing a little routine. But then also part of getting myself ready was starting to make fun of some of my teammates, like, you know, joking back and forth. Because you got to think about it, right? We, every single day, no matter what, because we were playing every day. When you're on tour, you're playing every day and sometimes twice. So... Sometimes you just don't have it in you to just be out there smiling and just be all in this great mood. And so you had to dig deep sometimes because life happens. Maybe you, you just got a phone call, you know, and you arguing with your with your with your mate or whatever. Right. So you need something to, to get you back there. So for me it was just going back and forth and having, you know, making fun of guys and hopefully they'll make fun of me and then we'll go back and forth, you know? And that's how I started getting, uh, you know, enthused to go out there with a big old smile and, and uh, entertaining the, the folks. Cause I couldn't be off. I couldn't. I, so some of the other teammates, they could hide a little bit because the focus is not on them a hundred percent of the time. Right. But when you're the showman, the focus is on you 95% of the whole show. So, you know, if I'm out there frowning or whatever, it's going to, it's going to show. So that's, that I didn't really have nothing for, for good luck. Uh, but yeah, it was just getting myself ready. So, so it sounds like the way you got pumped up was professionally ma- busting chops with all your friends <laughs> and getting paid for it. Go. That's how you got to do it. You got to like light. You got to lighten the mood. So you said you're 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 the showman. You guys are entertainers, right? People come to Harlem Globetrotters. They want to be entertained. It's gonna be a good time. They want to laugh. It's kind of like a, a comedy show on the basketball court. So Absolutely. you need to. You just kind of lighten the spirit. You start poking fun at people, like just getting people laughing, getting them in a good mood. Because I'll be honest with you, like you think about it, where I don't care what mood you're in. You could be in the crappiest mood ever. If somebody makes you laugh, guaranteed you're in a better mood than you were before you were laughing. Absolutely. Nobody is in a worse mood after they laugh. They laugh. Right. Facts. And and I and I enjoy people making fun of me too. I'm I'm the I, I'm okay with that. Yeah, you got if you problem. if you want to give it, you got to be able to take it. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, I I read somewhere that you have the Guinness Book of World Records for the longest hook shot. Is that correct? Yeah, it was, um, it was just, a, so that's the recorded. So like the official, it was a, uh, just from half court. Okay. Which I did. And you, you know, you go to YouTube and you can see some, some shots in the game, but like when the person from the Guinness book of world record was there, uh, that's, but I've made, man, uh, I remember in Argentina one time I was on the opposite end in front of the opposite bench and I took two tries and I made a hook on the second one <laughs> all the way to the other court. So I used to try to, you know, I used to try to like shoot them from way over there. Yeah, yeah. And that's really the longest one, but it's just not uh, recorded as the longest one. But anybody in my position, in my role uh, that I had as a showman, that's one of the things that you have to learn to do and, and make consistently. 
So, I mean, to the to the average Joe, it's, it's a big feat, but it's been it's been uh, made, you know, Metal Hog Lemon and, and all all yeah. others throughout. You know? So, so let me ask you this. So, you say that it's you know pretty. I don't want to say easy, but it's common. you make it's pretty common, like you said, for somebody in your position. So, if you were to take, if I were to give you ten shots from half court, ten hook shots from half court, how many are you making today? If you give me ten shots, I'm 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 missing eleven of the ten <laughs> <laughs> today. But at that time, if you were to give me ten, I'll probably make seven. Wow, seven! So you're shooting seventy percent hook shot half court. <laughs> but I was, I was, uh, but just think though, I'm practicing every single day before every game. I'm practicing the hook shot. That's you know? wild though, yeah. because some people I'm don't even make, some people don't even make 70% from the free throw line. <laughs> NBA players don't make 70% right. from the free throw line. He's making 70% half court hook shot. That's, that's an, that's an intense workout. And that's a lot of dedication to get down to that. It, it, it's a, a lot, man. A lot of, uh, because. You know, the globe trotters are fantastic at what they do, right? And we do tricks and all that. But they don't realize the ball still have to go through the hole. <laughs> yes. That's not a trick, right? That's a skill that you have to master. So you just have to practice. Before I became a globe trotter, I couldn't spin the ball on my finger. Now I can spin it on my head, you know? <laughs> So <laughs> it's just practicing and practicing and practicing. Because that's another thing too is that people don't realize that, like, like you, to your point, you see the Harlem Globetrotters, you see all these trick shots, but they don't realize that all of these guys are really good basketball players, yeah. like professional basketball players first, and then they become trick shot artists. But you, you still have to be good at basketball. Like these oh, guys yeah. are. If you put any of these guys, any of you guys on. A reg on a basketball team on a college team, they're 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 playing, All right. they're working those guys. <laughs> now it, I, we've had players come. We've had players come. You know, go from the globe trotters to the NBA and vice versa throughout the history. I mean, you can go as far back as you know, way 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 back. You know, Will Chamberlain was a Harlem Globe trotter. You know, and then you oh, can wow. fast forward when when Magic Johnson retired, he played. You know, he traveled with the globe trotters as a globe trotter for like a for like a season and we've had many others you know the first the first black nba player was a harlem globetrotter right a lot of the things like the three-point line came from the harlem globe the three-man weave came from a harlem globetrotter you know we we have an imprint in the game of basketball more than people the the everyday person knows about but like the globetrotters were very influential when it would in the basketball today. Unbelievable. Fun fact. I People know that. I just learned something today. Three point line was inspired by the Harlem Globetrotters. We were actually just talking about that the other day. Uh, we were in the cigar lounge and we were talking about um, the great basketball players. And we we're talking about, you know, like Michael Jordans, the, you know, LeBron James, Kobe Bryant, Larry Bird, and the name uh, Pete, uh, Pistol Pete came up, Pete Maravich. Yeah. And we were talking about how P Pistol Pete actually averaged something like 44 points a game in college. Yep. But it was before the three-point line. Wow. Yep. And they were saying that somebody went back and looked in and said, okay, because he used to shoot from far, from far away, but it only counted as two points. So they said that if he, they actually had the three-point line, he would have averaged 60 a game. Oh, jeez. <laughs> yeah, that's incredible. That's incredible, right? Let me... Let me pause and let me turn these lights on. Right. Sure. Yeah, no doubt, no doubt, no doubt. My 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 last question. We want to ask you some cigar questions, but we I have I a wanna, couple more questions. I want to bring up the uh, so the same article that I read about you setting the Guinness World Record for the hook shot. You also said that you wanted to set the Guinness World Record for the prettiest basketball player. Did you ever did you ever <laughs> manage to get that one? Hey hey, listen, man. I I if you ask my wife, I beat that record by a mile. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was so funny. I was like, I got to bring this up because I think that was like the first part of uh, like, like your your their questions. You're like, man, I wish I could be the Guinness World Record, the prettiest basketball player, but maybe next year. <laughs> so, before we get into cigar, some cigar questions and some non basketball related, I got to ask the one basketball question too. Is so just just so you know, 
He's a he's a collegiate basketball player. So when we I told him a Harlem Globetrotter, he was like, oh, he's like he loves talking basketball. So he was fired up. So I know he's got something brewing that he wants yeah, to. Yeah, I'm the basketball guy. I could talk about basketball all day long. Um, so we found out that you actually were a double from Michael Jordan in a Gatorade commercial. So being that, I mean, and you said that you graduated college in in 2000. Yep. So you were probably growing up, you know, grew up watching Jordan destroy the league. Favorite athlete of all time, man, for me. So how was that? Like you got to meet Michael Jordan. You played his double in a commercial. How, what's that experience like? It was incredible. So, again, these summer leagues that I was playing in in L.A. with Paul Pierce. Uh, so I was playing in this one league and I mean, I was I was having some incredible ducks. So come to find out the guy that was in charge of uh, the casting for that commercial, he was the one that was, that was, um, that was the owner of that league. So um, I, I had left cause that happened right when I left to go with, with the globe trotters and they, they were looking for me. They couldn't find me cause I left from one day to another, like I told you, right. So they couldn't find me. So they went to New York, L.A., Chicago, doing castings, trying to find somebody who had a similar build to Michael Jordan at the time of that in, in the 90s and could also do the dunks that he was doing back then. Wow. So they found guys with a similar build but couldn't do the dunks. And they also found guys that could do the dunks but didn't have a build. Uh, eventually, they this is the words of the director that he told me. He said they settled with Jamal Crawford. Wow, really? So, and then after they signed a contract with him, they found me. And um, the Globe Trotters would not allow me to do it at the time. So I told them, hey, the only way that I can do it is if you buy out my contract. So they said, okay, we got a plane ticket for you tomorrow to leave to, to Chicago and film this. So they bought out my contract. I left the Globe Trotters, And then two years later is when I came back and I did the 10 years that we know about. But so I left, I went to Chicago to film the commercial. And when I got there, Jamal Crawford was on the court. Um, but they asked him, once I got there, they asked him to, okay, let me step in. There was, there was day one. They hadn't even started recording. They were just kind of looking at the lighting and things like that. So never met Michael Jordan in my life. First time ever seen him in person. Never saw a game of Michael Jordan, nothing. So I walk up. And I extend my hand and I say, how you doing, Mr. Jordan? And he say, hey, how you doing, KD? Everyone's KD. So I'm like, whoa, this guy, Michael <laughs> Jordan knows my name. Like, Michael knows my name. So that alone was incredible. So the director comes up and he says, hey, listen, so this is what I want you guys to do. I want you guys to go out there and play one-on-one -on -one for real and we'll get shots from that. And we had some choreographed parts, but most 80% of it, I would say, was us really playing one-on-one. -on -one. Don't smile, kid. How much you want? <laughs> All day. Oh, okay. stay down on me. I got that. You got what? That's a youngster for you. So I'm like, you, you want me, in my mind, I'm like, you want me to play one-on-one -on -one against the greatest player that, ever lived and he was still an active NBA player yeah, because he was part of the Wizards at the time still averaging 30 you yeah, know he had a 51 pointer in the as a right. on the Wizards <laughs> so, so he was still Michael Jordan so they say um and then he walks away then he comes back director he said oh and by the way and you can curse on this or yeah yeah, yeah of course yeah okay, by the way I want you guys to talk shit to each other. So I'm like, okay, what can I possibly tell Michael Jordan when I'm playing one-on-one -on -one with him, right? Just when you thought it was safe to come outside. Bitch, won't score again. I won't score again? Well, look here. Sucker. You reach, I teach. Oh. Let's see. Lesson just started. Now, mine, obviously, you know, I'm timid. I'm scared. I'm nervous. And I was all I was thinking was I don't want to be that guy that when Sports Center comes around, it says, you know, headline news, Kevin Daly just hurt Michael Jordan playing one on one and he can no longer play and he has to retire because he hurt him. I didn't want to be that guy. 
So I'm very timid. And so he goes by me and he dunks on me in my face. Boom. I try to block it. He boom dunks on me. Everybody around is laughing. The director, the cameraman, everybody's just laughing. Now you play basketball. The worst thing that you can do to a basketball player is dunk on them. <laughs> yep. I'd rather you slap me before you dunk on me, right? So, and then he walks up to me, he say, hi, he laughing, right? He walks up and he all up in my face, like, ha ha, yeah, young fella, you didn't think I still had it, did you? So that's what he says to me. So I said, okay, this guy right here, I don't know who he think he is. He can't dunk on me. I'm the one that dunks on people. So I started looking at it like, I'm not looking at this guy as Michael Jordan anymore. I'm looking at this guy, somebody who's talking shit to me and just dunked on me and everybody's laughing at me. So three plays later, I have the ball at the top. I go around him and I probably, this is probably the highest I ever jumped in my entire <laughs> life. And I dunked on him. Now I'm like 25. I mean, I'm, I'm, man, I'm green. I'm fresh. My, my legs are good, right? They picked me for that commercial for a reason. You're not done. Excuse me. Right? So, boom! I dunked it so hard, the ball went through the net, and it hit him in the face. <laughs> right? So then I come off the rim like, yeah! And then I look around, expecting everybody to be laughing and cheering just like they were when, when he did it to me. Dead silence. <laughs> <laughs> And I'm like, oh, damn, I may have just ruined the best job I probably will ever have in my entire life. And he walks up to me with his hand like this, because I had just hit him right with, with the ball. And he said, hey, young fella, hey, young fella, don't forget, this is only a commercial. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, Yo, you didn't say that when you dunked on me, <laughs> right? So from that point on, it really got very competitive. You know, the director would say cut. Remember a few times, director said cut. And MJ was like, no, nah, man, what you mean cut? I'm teaching. Get out of here. I'm teaching this young, young guy. I'm teaching over here. Get out of here. So we would just be playing one-on-one. -on -one, and it was just a, a heck of an experience uh, on the times when we weren't filming. And we're just sitting next to each other. You know, I just got a, an opportunity to, I didn't want to be all over him, but I got chances to ask some questions that I always wanted to know. Simple questions like, you know, why did you do that move against the Lakers when you went up one side and then brought it up this side? Yeah, when he could have dunked it. <laughs> right. I'm like, why did you do that? And then, so I got the answer. He said Sam Perkins was right there, so he thought he was going to block it. I asked him what was his favorite uh, Jordan shoes. And that was the one commercial, the most iconic commercial. Some people call it the best uh, Gatorade commercial of all time. That's ugly. Could have done. You should have done. But we filmed some other ones too. Um, and I remember one time when we filmed, he came in in a motorcycle and then about five other motorcycles, all his with his boys, came in, run, run, run the motorcycle. And then I asked him, I said, yo, man, don't you... You know, you get, you know, you're worth all this money. So many people depend on you. Ain't you scared of getting hurt on this motorcycle? He said, look here, KD, man, when I put this helmet on, nobody knows it's me. And it's just so liberating because that's the one time that nobody's bothering me. Wow. And then I started to think, I said, man, I can imagine being a Michael Jordan. You can't go anywhere. No doubt. You can't have that regular life that we just talked about. Mm-hmm. But he was, uh, people always ask me, you know, is he a nice guy? And all I can speak of is my experience with him. He was a very, very nice guy to me. You know, I have some posters, you know, from our actual filming that, uh, that they brought to me you know, on the last day and he signed and I blew one up where I'm dunking it. He was teaching me, he was saying, hey, listen, like me and Pippen to warm up, we'll just get right under the basket and just start dunking off a of vert, just dunking to warm up the legs. He's like, you didn't try it. So I'm like, boom, it's boom. And then one of the pictures the cameraman got is me dunking it with my legs spread. And through my legs, you can see Michael Jordan right up on me, holding a ball, looking up at me like this, as I'm hanging on the rim. 
So I got, I blew that up and I have it upstairs. But that, that those was like one of my favorite shots of all time. You know, I grew up watching him and he's watching me in that picture. Right. But it was a fantastic experience, man. I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't switch it for anything. I mean, that's just, that sounds, cause like I said, being a basketball fan, it's just, you can't not idolize Michael Jordan. Yeah. And then now you get, not only, like, you probably walked in, they said, you don't play one on one. You go, excuse me? What the hell? <laughs> what? I'm playing one. And then I bet that, you know, Michael's a super, super competitive, like to the next yes. level competitive. So he dunks on you. Three plays later, you dunk on him. And I bet you he wanted to just turn the cameras off. And now he's coming. <laughs> Yeah, that, he just wanted. He said, "Man, I'm about to show him why my name is Michael Jordan," and uh, and he did that. Like, so what I learned about him when it came to basketball, obviously he wasn't as quick as he he used to be, but he was very crafty. You know, he just knew how to get the shot off. You know, he just he, he, I I was just amazed at how the skill level, obviously, right, and how he was. I could see why he was so good. And I couldn't imagine playing him when it was 90, like if it oh. was like in the 94 or whatever. I couldn't, I couldn't imagine it. Oh, it would have been. Cause that's another thing I was, I was going to ask you is when you were playing defense on him, were there times where you're just like, I don't know what to do. <laughs> I mean, so it's, it's a little different because, you know, it's not five on five. Right. right? It's, so it's totally different. Like, yeah. It's a little different, but like I said, he was very good at getting a shot off against me and, you know, one little pump fake and I'm flying and he's gone before I, I hit the floor. You know, it, it was just, it was just amazing. And I played with many NBA players. I played, I played with Magic Johnson. I played with Kobe, you know, growing up in LA, I, I went to UCLA. UCLA was the place where all the good runs used to be. Mm -hmm. So I played, you know, you know Ke Kevin Garnett, you know, I mean, so many players. Michael Jordan was just at another level, man. Just another level. I can't. And you, you played him in what? Two thousand and two was it? Yep. I can't. Like nope. that. Can imagine playing him because there's some games. Right. I've seen some guys. I, you know, I used to watch tons of film of of Jordan, and I can't imagine just like having to guard him all yeah. all game. I remember there's a story. He walked in. Uh, they were playing against the Bullets. And he walked in to the opposing to the Bullets locker room with a lit cigar, <laughs> and and asked, took a puff and asked, "Who's checking me tonight?" Oh, yes, <laughs> and and everybody's looking around like, and they point at who is, and he's just like, and just nods and walks out. And he dropped fifty five on him. Like, who does yeah. that? Yep, yeah. yep. Yeah. <laughs> that's unbelievable. I mean, that's an awesome story. Appreciate you sharing that. Yeah, too. that is like that is. That, you had you were very vivid. And articulate, and so I felt like I, I was I felt like I was one of the crew members like, wa watching watching you guys play ball. <laughs> I could tell that what? that's probably one you of your favorite laugh stories. At me too, man. You wanted to laugh at me when you hear that story too. <laughs> you felt like you were right there. <laughs> I could tell that that's one oh. of your favorite stories. Just how like animated and vivid you told it. It is, man. I talk about it. Um, I wrote a an, an autobiography, and I I talk about the whole experience. One chapter is the whole experience of. You know, me meeting Michael Jordan and that story's in there and other little stories too. Yeah, we were actually uh we were gonna ask about that. That's the the book called I Never Stopped Smiling. Yes. Yeah, yes. we definitely uh, gotta, gotta get a gotta get a, buy a copy. Yeah, gotta get a copy of that book. I wanna read that. Um because it I mean going through it, I saw a little description of the book and it talks about what we were just talking about before is the whole life from Panama going to um, the struggles in Panama, then moving to UC to LA and then going to UCLA and then transferring from UCLA and then going to to Australia, to Taiwan, yep. all these different places. I mean, yep. that's just one hell of a life story that I definitely, definitely got to read. Yeah, man, I, I talk about everything, man. I'm I'm open, you know, things that I'm not proud of is still in the book. Um, the first chapter, which was the last chapter that I wrote, which was the toughest chapter that, that I had to write, it starts off with the whole situation about uh, uh, my mother committing suicide when I was three years old. Wow. So I, you know, I described the whole situation based on what was told to me, but uh, yeah, man, I just opened up um, the reason why I wrote, I'll tell you why I wrote the book. Please. So I was in Washington, DC uh, 
I was an inv invited to an event called Do the Right, like writing, do the right thing, where kids um, from all over the nation won some type of award to get them there. And they were they were sharing these life, traumatic life experiences that they had. Like, I mean, kids that saw their father kill their mother in front of them. I mean, that, that bad, right? And then I say, you know what? These kids are so brave to tell their story. You know, if I tell my story, it may help somebody. So that's when I decided to tell my story. And up to that point, I was in my 30s when I wrote that. Up to that point, it was very difficult for me to talk about the whole losing my mother. I couldn't even talk about it. My, I lost her at three and I'm 30 something and I couldn't talk about it. But once I wrote the book, um, it was therapeutic, right? And now I'm, I, I can freely, comfortably talk about it. Obviously it's still a sad situation, but I can talk about it and it has helped many people. So I'm very, very proud of that. I didn't have any intentions of winning an award or whatever, but it ended up winning uh, the Reader's Choice Award uh, for that category uh, in uh, whatever year that was. But that was, which was like, wow, I couldn't believe that. But yeah, man, I'm very, very proud of, of, of that book for sure. Definitely. Yeah, that's, and that's, you know, that's something beautiful is that you can, like you said, it was therapeutic for you, but it was also a book that can help a lot of people uh, just showing people and telling people how you've overcome trials and tribulations to get where you are. And there's, you know, everything is not sunshine and rainbows and it never will be. Right. And there's always going to be challenges and things that most, like right. I said before, is when we were talking about people going to the restaurant and they just want to have regular lives. And I was saying that they have problems that you don't see. You only just see the, the, the glamour mm -hmm. on TV. Yep. But you don't realize that there's a lot of other things that people had to overcome. So that's that's beautiful. You were able to write a book, it helped you and help other people. Yep, absolutely. Can't wait to buy it. I'm buying, right, no, I'm I'm buying, I'm buying on Amazon tonight. All right. So let let's we're getting almost to the to the end here. So let's talk about some sticks. Some I know cigars. You're big on TikTok. Your whole TikTok's about cigars. That's how I 100%. that's how I found you. So thank you first and foremost for duetting one of my TikToks because that's how, that's how I found you. I thought you were kidding. I thought it was a joke. I even wrote it down in my diary. Veronica had a very funny joke today. I laughed at it later that night. Y'all yeah. have some good content, man. I like the production of, of the videos. Well, thank, thank you. Thank you, thank thank you very you. much. We, uh, yeah. we, it's, we put some time into it. You know, we try to put a different spin on cigars. Cigars has a lot of negative stigmas around it. So we try to bring that human element, that comedic element, and, you know, and, yeah. and the person-to-person -person element, what we do on the podcast. But, um, you know, how did you get into cigars? Like, how, what, was the, what was your first cigar, if you remember? Like, how was that whole process like? How did you get into it? So... <sighs> just thought smoking a cigar looked cool right <laughs> it's like man that's that's like you 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 like a boss smoking a cigar right oh like, yeah like some type of like you get some type of like it's like a prestige right so that's when that's when i really started smoking cigar but i didn't know anything about cigar i didn't even know you had to maintain them a certain way so i'll have a cigar in my drawer for like okay, I'm going to smoke this at some point and I won't smoke it for like three months later and <laughs> not even knowing that this cigar is dry as hell, right? <laughs> um, so that's that's why I started smoking a cigar. But then later, a few years later, this is probably, I'll say about seven years or so, I started learning about it and I started going to cigar lounges and what really kept me smoking cigar is the culture of cigars, the smoking, the actual act of smoking a cigar is cool. You know, you, you get a nice little, you know, you get to taste different notes and you get a nice little high and all that. It's cool. But for me, my favorite part is just being able to share a moment with someone. Right. Um, you know, it takes you about an hour, hour and a half to properly smoke most cigars. Right. And you can have conversations conversations with somebody that you don't even know for about an hour and a half while you're smoking that cigar. That was so appealing to me. So that's really my favorite thing about cigar is just that culture, man. It, there's, and then you don't know that culture until you're part of that culture. Mm -hmm. Most definitely. It, you can see my TikToks, you know, they're all fun. 
the educational when it comes to cigar, but I talk a lot about the culture. People ask me, what's your favorite cigar? You know, which one should I do? I, I, I can't tell you what's going to be your favorite, man. You got to try it. Yeah. Right. It's all right. on you. Can't nobody. And then I always talk about top five things to do this and don't do this, but I always end it like, hey, listen, one of the things you shouldn't do is listen to anything I just said, because you pay for that stick yourself. Do whatever the hell you want to do with the cigar. Exactly. Exactly. Absolutely, I mean, they man. say like, what's your favorite stick? The one I'm smoking right now. That's right. <laughs> no. Right. But, right. But I do have favorites. Um, but um, that's my personal favorite. So what are some you of know? those favorites? So I have some obviously recognizable ones. Uh, we talked about the Milanio Oliva Siri V. Uh, I'm a big uh, Rocky Patel you know, I like those, Alec Bradley, uh, I like those. But I'm gonna tell you about one that you probably, you probably never heard of. Uh, I can safely say they're probably one of the most uh, fastest growing cigar brands out of Dallas, by the way, um, in the past year. They're called Definition Cigars. And then they're a little bit unique because they don't typically use these type of labels. Um, they use a garment, right? And they put it around. I think I've seen it? them. I think I just I think I just followed them on Instagram. And it's all different. Like each garment's a di- it's like a different color. Yes. Yes. I just yes. I that's funny. I just fo- and it's yeah. funny. I wonder if it's because of like you know how like the phone kind of listens and the phone knows what you look up and yeah. stuff. So I wonder if it's because like I follow you. And then it recommends or puts them on the explore page or something like that. Because I do remember seeing that. Yeah. There's no words. There's no nothing. It's just a different color. Yeah. I got to try it. Them. It could be. It could be. And I, and, and I, know, I know those guys personally. But I'll tell you this. If I didn't feel that way about the cigars, I wouldn't be telling you that. Right? I'll just probably tell you, hey, man, these guys are doing a great thing. You know? But the cigars are fantastic. And they're rapidly becoming... Uh, one of my favorite cigars. And I, I, I tell you, I was talking to one of the guys, and I don't know if you know who Face on Love is, but if you saw, if you saw Friday, Big Worm. Oh, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. So he, big was worm, big worm. <laughs> <laughs> so he was in town recently, and he smoked one of those cigars, and he said, hey, man, I'm not leaving town until I can get a box of these. So, I mean, they're so good, and the people are learning about these this cigar brand. So, I'm very proud to see what they're doing and they're constantly getting new cigars out there, man. Definition cigars, man. If you haven't had one, I can get you, I can get, uh, I can see if I can get a, a couple in your hands, man. You got to try them. For sure. Absolutely. I'll I definitely, I, I'll I definitely want to, yeah, definitely want to try. I saw them and I thought that was very unique. It kind of reminded me of a company called Ezra Cigars and Ezra Cigars has something like that where they, they, it's kind of like they tie it and they tie it into like a little bow almost mm-hmm. on the cigar. Uh, and it reminded me of that. And, I, and I'm glad that what you said about earlier about why, the real reason why you like cigars is the people around you. Yes. yes. I, I say it all the time. Like, you don't have to thoroughly love cigars. If you can enjoy just the the time you're smoking a cigar, whether it's once a month, a few times a year, right. you're going to savor those moments all the time. Because if you don't smoke cigars a lot, typically you're smoking with people. And typically, you'll be spending time with those people, and those that's those are the best times. Like if you're BSing with your boys, or if you're with your family, if you're celebrating, yep. those are the best times. And that's what the cigar is all about. And that's what this podcast is all about. And that's you know why we're together is because of one thing. Right. And that's a cigar, and it's yeah. and we constantly preach about it. It's not really about the cigar. Obviously, it plays a part, but it's about the community because. Until yeah. I started a, an Instagram about four or five years ago, I didn't realize how big the cigar community was and how accommodating and insightful and very personable a lot of the people in the cigar community are. It's fascinating. Yeah, and it's crazy because I started my TikTok during the pandemic board. Let me just do something different. And um, I decided to just talk about cigars. And I didn't realize how big it is. I grew to almost 50,000 followers. All I do is talk about cigars and I just find a way to, you know, whatever's popular to just make it a twist on, on cigars. And, and it's been a lot of fun and I've met some cool people. I met, met you through there. So I met some cool people uh, just through having the, the same connection of, uh, of a cigar. 
Yeah, I mean that's like you said, that's what it's all about meeting meeting people and like you said, having just an hour, hour and a half to smoke a, a cigar and have the conversation exactly what we're doing right now, getting to meet. I mean, shit, we've met all all sorts of people, all different walks of life. You meet them all, and it's it's just it's fantastic. Right. So right. we always, we always say like presidential debate should be in a cigar lounge, <laughs> oh. smoking a cigar. <laughs> yes. <All> right. Man. <laughs> Things. Would- I'll definitely. I'll definitely be in the audience for that. Right? No doubt. No doubt. And one of the one of my favorite things to always say is like, you know, why do you like cigars so much? Like, what does it do for you? I'm like, well, you know, if you're smoking a cigar by yourself, you're decompressing, you're reflecting on your thoughts, you're reflecting on your goals or whatever. But I'd rather pay twenty dollars for a cigar than a hundred fifty dollars for a therapy session. Amen you know, to that. This is a th- this is a cheaper therapy session, and it's way better. Right. Right. No doubt. Right. So, so Kev, so we're we're. Towards the end here, so what we like to do um, at the end of the show, first off, first and foremost, we appreciate you taking yeah. the time. Cheers, Cheers. to you. Uh, thank you so much for, for taking your time to be on the Burnout Podcast. What we like to do is give you the red carpet now. So tell the people that are watching, tell the people that are listening where they can find you, What uh, sure. if you're doing anything. Um, we know you're a little bit of a philanthropist, so if you have fundraisers or right. anything like that, let everybody know where they can find you, what they can do, how they can connect with you. Yeah, man. And so all of my social media is the same uh, is Mr. Trotter 21, Mr. Trotter 21. So uh, I'm not big on posting things for the likes, right? I do a lot of things behind closed doors, but every now and then I need the support of the, the public, right? So I, I'll reach out. So if you follow me on any of those social media, uh, that'll be the best, the best place to find me on Instagram, uh, you can find me by name on Facebook. And also, if you want to learn about cigars and be entertained at the same time, TikTok is the place to be. But it's MR Trotter 21. Okay. Love it, man. So be sure if you're listening, be sure uh, if you're watching, go check out Kevin. Great TikTok. Great brother right here. We appreciate the time. We had a great conversation with you. And uh, with that being said. Hey, man. Thank you, Mr. Daly. It was a pleasure and an honor. A true thank gentleman. You. It was awesome smoking a cigar with you and getting to know you. So thank you. Thank you for having me, man. Just reach out to me when uh, when the team makes it to New York, and I'll do my best to get to get y'all there, man. We, we, appreciate, we, we appreciate that, appreciate man. That, man. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you. We appreciate that, brother. Until next All time, right, man. Y'all keep it up, man, and let me know when that cigar is out, man. So I'll I'll, uh, I'll post something about it on my TikTok and I'll light it up, man. Yeah. Well, uh, we got we got your TikTok, we got your email, so we'll definitely be uh, be reaching out to you once those come out. We should, you know, they said they should be done around February, so cr- fingers crossed, and uh, let, let's hope so. So until then, man, and you're in Dallas, you said? I am. All right, Dallas is a pretty frequent, pretty accessible area, so whenever we're in Dallas, we know what to hit up. Hey, man, hit me up. You're in Dallas. You you already know, man. We we smoking one. Let's Absolutely. do it. Let's do it. And until next time, thank you, brother. Appreciate right, it, man. Kev. All right, man. Thank y'all both. It's all good. good.